For 222 days, Nigerian users of Twitter were denied formal usage of the microblogging site Twitter. The suspension had a number of direct and indirect consequences. Now, network data shows that access to the platform and back-end servers have been restored on leading networks in the country. In the beginning, it was thought that Nigeria's decision to suspend Twitter at first indefinitely, but later temporarily, could backfire for the government and cost the country economically in terms of new investment into its technology sector. There was fear that the ban may threaten Nigeria's status as one of the best performing African countries in attracting investment for technology startup businesses. According to the NetBlock's cost of shutdown tool, Nigeria reportedly lost 104.02 million naira, that's about $250,000 every hour to the ban, bringing daily losses to 2.46 billion naira. By the end of January the 12th, it was 5,328 hours in the, in the 222 days since the social networking site was blocked and Nigeria had reportedly lost about 546.5 billion naira. In announcing the lifting of the suspension, the chairman of the Technical Committee, Nigeria Twitter Engagement, and Director General of the National Information Technology Development Agency, Kashifu Inu Abdullahi, said that the San Francisco-based technology company had agreed to meet the government's conditions. Are there long-term consequences to the suspension? How much has it cost Nigeria? We'll get into all of this as we look at the cost of Nigeria's Twitter suspension. This is Business Edge, and I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adileru Balogo. My guest today is Ayo Bankole Akinto Joye. He's a strategic expert and the convener of the Lagos SME Boot Camp. Ayo, welcome to Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Tolu. Good morning. All right, good morning to you. So let's start with some of the concerns that were initially raised with the Twitter suspension, and let's see in retrospect if those concerns have been valid. Now, in the aftermath of the suspension, there, those concerns that came about were around freedom of speech, Nigerian businesses on Twitter, and of course the overall economic effect that the suspension would have. Looking at it now, 222 days um, down the line, were those fears valid? Of course, those fears were very invalid. Um, look, Twitter has come to become a global uh, powerhouse for freedom of speech, for conversations, for driving interactions, for pushing um, narratives, for uh, flattening uh, the call between the governed, the business community, and the general masses. And um, clearly, uh, certain interests, especially political interests globally, were uncomfortable with uh, that flattening of that call. Uh, several governments in various uh, territories have tried in different ways to stifle that freedom of speech and control the way um, uh, the general public uh, access or uh, approach their various governments. Uh, and other social media platforms themselves regulate uh, information and uh, the circulation of it on those platforms. And that was the major uh, uh, problem that led to this in Nigeria. Uh, and look, the concerns that government gave, uh, most of it are invalid, but the concerns that the citizens have, um, which was um, uh, stifling of freedom of speech, stifling of, go uh, of, of, of businesses revenue, um, MSMEs, the content creators, players in the digital space, those are very valid concerns. And you can see the numbers. We've lost, we've lost, we've lost hundreds, we've lost millions of USD in revenue. Businesses have died. Businesses are suffering, people in the media space have suffered, people in technology space have suffered, and 222 days later, it has been an effort in futility. Mm. And we'll get into those numbers, especially when you look at the number of users that um, Nigeria currently has reportedly on Twitter. But when it comes to this issue of revenue and loss, Nigeria's revenue that is generated by Twitter may be small compared to some other places, but is it safe to say that it wasn't only Nigeria that lost, that Twitter also lost out in the period of this suspension? No, not 
actually, I mean, Twitter would lose out. But um, again, what's the significance of Twitter of, of, of Twitter's loss? You know, sorry, what's the significance of the loss uh, of revenue by Twitter in the Nigerian economy and uh, the overall, um, what's it called, the overall picture, the overall revenue bucket? Possibly insignificant, but irrespective. Um, I mean, a business is a business, no matter what comes from there. Uh, if they were not interested in what comes from here, they definitely wouldn't even have gone to the negotiation table. So, um, yeah, I believe that is a, is a, is a two-way thing. Uh, we lost, Twitter lost. Uh, thank God we are back now. But uh, as size numbers, it, is, it, is, it, it was very bad for Nigeria's, uh, Nigeria's PR, Nigeria's position as a democratic entity, uh, as a democratic state that, uh, 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 that is uh, a signatory to global conventions around uh, freedom of speech, around human rights, um, and around access to information. All right, so let's look at the numbers now. So NetBlock, the global internet monitoring organization, has a cost of shutdown tool that, con um, that basically calculates how internet restrictions and shutdowns cost. For Nigeria, it estimated that the country lost 104.02 million naira, um, about $250,600 every hour to the ban, giving you a total of about $2.46 billion every day. And that would be devastating for any economy. But it's also estimated that there are around 3 million Nigerians, 3.1 million Nigerians active on Twitter. So when you look at the numbers, do you think these numbers actually correlate? Because what is, where is the money that Nigerians are making on Twitter? Because a lot of people would also question what's being done on Twitter that's bringing in this large amount of revenue. No, I, I, I don't. I mean, without uh, trying to undermine um, income that comes from social media, I, I think that some of those numbers are overstated uh, because um, if you look at, you know, wh what is Nigeria's, what's the size of the total, you know, digital economy in Nigeria? It's just about 15% of, um, of, of, of our total economic size, right? And our total economic size is just about 430 billion USD. I think that those numbers are overstated. However, um, I also know that um, quite a lot of income, you know, quite a lot of income exchange hands, a lot of revenue exchange hands on Twitter, uh, on Facebook, and other social media platforms. Um, I know, for example, that the entire media space now rely on uh, 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 on Twitter to drive narratives as the primary source of driving narratives, and then they circulate those narratives even via digital, uh, via traditional platforms. So as against uh, traditional platforms being the in, uh, original source of creating narratives, now uh, media agencies, <clears throat> media houses uh, try to generate those conversations via Twitter, and then they then circulate it via digital platforms. Uh, you also have content creators, you have brands who are doing promotions, you have influencers, you know, getting gigs on a daily basis. So yeah, I know that a lot of money uh, exchange hands. The global uh, uh, digital economy size is about 11.5 trillion USD. Nigeria should be about uh, 6 billion uh, USD. I, I do not think that, um, you know, $2.4 billion on a daily basis is, is, a, is a loss is, is, is a realistic figure given the size of our economy. Mm -hmm. What do you think is more realistic? So I would say maybe if you say six, if you say five to six billion dollar annually divided by divided by uh, three sixty five, mm. that would be a decent, a decent figure. That should be maybe around. I, I can't think of off the top of my head now, but maybe between hundred hundreds of millions of USD, or maybe hundred two hundred on a daily basis. That is fair, or maybe fifty million, something around that range. You know, but that's just a very rough, wild guesstimate. Mm. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be thinking in the, in, the, in the space of billions of dollars a day. I mean, how much do we even make from, from oil and gas on a daily basis that um, Twitter alone will not be giving us that much loss? Okay. All right. I, I'm going to ask you to hold on. Um, Nigeria's government has said that Twitter has agreed to its conditions. We want to look at the business side of those conditions when we come back after this break. You're watching Business Edge, and there are a lot of conversations to be had two days after Nigeria's government lifted the suspension on Twitter. Now, Nigeria's economy and even government have become increasingly reliant on digital media. Data from the National Bureau of Statistics show that the ICT sector was the fastest growing sector of Nigeria and has proven vital for economic diversification. What impact did the suspension have on the sector? 
The Nigerian government has also said that Twitter has agreed to meet its conditions. After the break, we'll get into the business side of those conditions. Stay with us. And this is Business Edge. We're looking at the cost of Nigeria's Twitter suspension. Joining me is Ayo Bankole Akintu Joye. He's a strategic expert and the convener of the Lagos SME Boot Camp. Now, in recent years, a number of countries have blocked particular applications, shutting down specific services like instant messaging and voice over internet protocol calling, turning off mobile telecommunication services, or disrupting the entire internet. Those actions separate people from their family, friends, and livelihoods, and also undermine economic growth, interfering with the startup ecosystem and threatening social stability by interrupting economic activity. So Ayo, I want us to look at this now from an investor standpoint. And if I was an investor who wanted to get into Nigeria's um, growing tech space, startup ecosystem, what would this tell me? What would this suspension that lasted 222 days Tell me about the Nigerian uh, economy or the Nigerian sector that I want to invest in. What conclusions do you think an investor would draw from what has happened? I mean, it will simply tell you that, um, you know, the political environment in Nigeria is volatile. That's what it simply tells you. It simply tells you that we are led by, um, you know, individuals that do not understand um, economic or technology fundamentals uh, and it's, it's simple um, you want to drive a digital economy you know that's what the government does claim to be his agenda uh, what are the elements of a digital economy one you have digital infrastructure right where are we on digital infrastructure we're still very poor and um, you know our, our broadband penetration is still very low we we have a household penetration of about 0 0.04 percent as of 2018 which is below uh, the African regional average, African regional average of, of 0 0.6 uh, and below, you know, world average of 13.6%, right? Um, you, you have uh, uh, digital financial services, over, over 60 million Nigerians, adult Nigerians are still, do not have bank accounts, right? And we haven't done much around that side. You have digital entrepreneurship, which is where um, a lot of brilliant young entrepreneurs are driving uh, innovation to support the economy. Government is stifling the guys around that area through their, their agencies and through these types of uh, uh, arbitrary bans, right? You have digital skills, which is still very low literacy level and all of these things. And then you have digital platforms, right? Now, we've tried to do as much as we can using digital platforms, even though the infrastructure is poor. And then a government that then claims to be serious about digital, driving digital economy, then decides to clamp down on one of the most uh, 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 fertile platforms that exists, right? Meaning that, okay, this last, the fifth of these five elements, which seem to even be taking a lot of traction, you are then clamping down on it again, in addition to what you've done around clamping down on entrepreneurship, clamping down on digital financial services. So it simply means that, look, it simply tells me as an investor that, man, this government is not serious about, about, about digital economy. Fortunately, fortunately, um, investors have been able to separate uh, 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 the, 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 the seriousness or understanding or exposure or finesse or otherwise of our government from the innovation and entrepreneurship and creativity of the young people. So that's why you see that irrespective of all of these volatile political regulations you, uh, uh, and policy regulations, you see that uh, the people in, our, in, in the tech space still keep getting a lot of funding because the world connects with Nigeria's creativity and innovation. Okay, very valid point there. Now, let's look at this in terms of the conditions that Nigeria set for Twitter, and they've said that the company has agreed to. The statement that announced the suspension being lifted said that Twitter has agreed to, one, register in Nigeria during the first quarter of 2022, two, appoint a designated country representative, three, comply with tax obligations in Nigeria, four, enroll Nigeria in its portal for direct communications between government officials and Twitter to manage prohibited content that violates Twitter community rules, and five, act respectfully with acknowledgement of Nigerian laws. When you look at these conditions and the business side of it, setting up an office which will come with some sort of out cost and, of course, hiring for the company and paying taxes, what conclusions do you reach about the conditions or what the Nigerian government was thinking in putting these conditions out? Okay, so um, 
I mean, to be fair, it's to the interest of Nigeria if Twitter um, opens office in Nigeria. But again, let's look at those conditions. None of it has been met. All of it has still promised free. Uh, you know, Nigeria, they're going to register by Q1 2022. You could as well have gotten them to make all of these commitments without necessarily banning them. And you're also suspending them. And this entire banning suspension strategy is is Stone Age governance. You know, you want to drive conversations with the global platform to, to invest in your economy. You don't start by suspending their operations, right? If you wanted to suspend their operations, and I, I beg your pardon, if you wanted them to register, you simply, you know, issue them, you know, uh, 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 notices, and then you begin, you know, negotiations. You, you don't suspend. It's, it's clear and that we are not being, we are, we are being, we are being, we are being, Economical with the truth as the real motive and intent for this. Um, if, if it's just to register as an entity in Nigeria, I don't think that requires banning. If it's if it's to come and physically set up an office here, I do not. I'm not aware that you can compel a global organization uh, that is running on on digital uh, uh, infrastructure to set up a physical office before they can operate in your country. Except you want to lock your country from, from, from a global wave, right, uh, and trend. And then what does acknowledgement with Nigerian laws mean? Uh, uh, acknowledge, acknowledge what law? What law has not been acknowledged before, right? Is, is the president coming on the digital platform to talk about, to threaten a, 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 a certain set of people or, or individuals making statements that are unguarded, which uh, Twitter takes off? Is that not acknowledging is that is what does respectful acknowledgement mean, right? If we have our laws and you see that um, Twitter is con in contravention of those laws, you take them to court, right? The courts are there. You have execution channels for for for, for executing your your laws, right? You don't suspend a platform because you want them to respectfully acknowledge your law. I don't even know what that means, to be honest. So you can see that uh, those things. I, I do not agree. Or I do not believe that that we won that we won this battle. I think that we have to suspend it because clearly there are political implications of, I told you, Twitter has become the world's biggest digital platform in driving political propaganda. So in the Nigerian government, especially the APC regime, uh, came on power, into power in 2015, largely driven by huge propaganda that, that, was, that was channeled via Twitter and other social media platforms. And they know that they cannot afford not to have that tool at their disposal going into 2023. I okay. believe that that's what this is about. Okay. And not all the economic conditions. But let, let me stick with one of those conditions because it actually has now been put into law uh, with the passing of the finance uh, bill of 2021. And that has to do with paying of taxes. And that part of the uh, law actually talks about non-resident, foreign, uh, almost digital technology companies that are making revenue um, from Nigeria. And Twitter falls under this. How do you think that particular thing will play out? Because that's not, quote unquote, aimed at Twitter. That's part of now Nigeria's finance laws that's dealing with companies such as Twitter. So how do you think that will play out? No, that's a brilliant regulation. I mean, that, that, that Finance Act um, um, element is amazing, right? So it's so that we don't keep leave money on the table because we are unable to capture um, uh, revenue and economic activities that happen on the digital space. That's brilliant, which is which brings us back to what I was going to say, that what I was saying earlier that we do not need to suspend anybody before we came up with that law, and we do not even need to suspend anybody before we execute it. We do not need any of them to be physically here. Amazon doesn't have to be physically here. Facebook doesn't have to be physically here. Twitter doesn't have to be physically here before we can before we can implement those regulations. They are not in all countries all over the world, and countries in you know several countries all over the world have found ways to tax them. So again, uh, uh, everything on that list are things we could have achieved without suspending Twitter. So I do not believe that. Um, I, I, while I agree that, that that law is excellent, we need to tax these guys. We need to regulate them in, uh, in a way that still protects the sanctity of freedom of speech and protects the rights of Nigerians to effectively communicate between themselves and between their leadership. All right, so I'll finally, before I let you go, there is now a call for the administration to compensate Nigerian businesses on Twitter who lost out during the suspension. Uh, the Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Agenda, Serap, says it plans to take the administration to court in order to get compensation for businesses. 
What do you think about this? Should businesses be somehow financially compensated for the losses they bore uh, in this time period? Compensation is going to be difficult. Uh, I mean, CEWAP is, is the social rights advocacy group. Uh, they are well within their rights to take government to court. We need people like them. Uh, but I am a strategist. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I like to discuss what is realistic, right? So who, how do you measure those that have lost uh, revenue, right? You know, how do you, who are they? You know, who, how do you assess the impact of what who has lost, you know? So the big telcos, they've lost, the big banks, right? They probably lost, uh, you know, so many people, MSMEs especially, who fall in my primary constituency, right? Most of them are in the informal space. How do you capture them into your, into your, even if you get the judgment and they say, oh, go and compensate, right? You, you know how things are done in this country. You probably will just create another window of siphoning funds for some ministry who's going to say, oh, we've compensated Nigerians with 10 billion naira, right? And then, you know, you assess those who have benefited from the 10 billion, they may not be more than five or 10. So again, it's there are too many issues for us to be chasing in the court of law that I don't think adding this is, is going to be any major benefit. But well, I mean, if, if anybody's fighting for our rights, who are we not to support them? All right, Ayo, we'll leave it on that note. Thank you so much for joining me. And as you said, uh, MSMEs are your primary constituency, and we look forward to having further conversations on how the ecosystem and the tech space can also help businesses like that. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll be happy to do that. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. All right. And so the conditions are there, many of them, probably all of them, yet to be met. But it seems, as my guest said, a more promissory, a promissory situation. And Nigeria could have achieved this necessarily, not with a suspension. But in the next few days and weeks, we'll, of course, be having more conversations as more information around this comes to light. And hopefully we'll be getting a further statement from the site at the center of it all. That is Twitter. You're watching Business Edge. Up next is NC4 to watch. And these are a few stories we're keeping our eyes on. We start in Zimbabwe, where the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe has said that total banking sector loans and advances increased by 22.98% for the September 21, uh, 2021 quarter. Now, the surge in loans and advances for the quarter is attributable to the translation of foreign currency denominated loans. Foreign currency denominated loans accounted for 32% of total banking sector loans as of September 30th, 2021. Investors are questioning whether Ghana, whether Ghana can sustain its debt levels if a surge in borrowing costs shuts it out of international markets. This is as the government debt in West Africa's second largest economy climbed to 81.5% of gross domestic product at the end of 2021, from 31.4% a decade ago. This places Ghana among the most vulnerable credits to tighter U.S. monetary policy despite strong economic growth. China's record-breaking export strength continued into December, pushing the annual trade surplus to a new high and providing support to an economy being dragged down by a property market slump and sporadic COVID-19 outbreaks. Exports in December were $340.5 billion, while imports were $246 billion in December and $2.69 trillion for the year leaving a trade surplus of $94.5 billion for the month and $676 billion for the full year, according to a Customs Administration statement. And finally, a Mozambican court has cleared the former head of Standard Bank Group's local units of accusations made by the country's central bank that he was involved in manipulating the foreign currency market. Adimo Hanama in Wokocha, who was the Banco de Mozambique in July last year, was barred from corporate positions at local lenders, had no role in boosting the strength of the local currency, according to a ruling by the tribunal. And that's Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining me. Don't forget to follow us on social media, download our mobile app, and of course, take us with you wherever you go. Monday, 11 a.m. West African time. Make it a date. We're back with Business Edge. I'm Tolu Lopez. Adela Rufalubu.